The Gospel of Mark, Chapter 1 The Beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God Some early sources omit the Son of God from verse 1, but I don't think this is material, as all sources have the centurion saying truly this was the Son of God after Jesus died in Mark 15, verse 39. Mark then claims to quote from the prophet Isaiah, saying, As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, Look, I am sending you my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. Isaiah doesn't say this, or at least not all of it. Actually, it's an amalgam of Exodus 23.20, Malachi 3.1 and Isaiah 43. In other words, it is a supposed Old Testament prophecy that has been synthesised by Mark from disparate snippets of Old Testament text taken out of context. But Mark's purpose is clear. He wishes to enhance the holiness of his key character by arranging for an Old Testament prophecy to connect him to a well-known holy man of the time, John the Baptist. Mark goes on. In the wilderness, John the baptizer began preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. People from the whole Judean countryside and all of Jerusalem were going out to him, and he was baptising them in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. John wore a garment made from camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. This was a desert-dwelling hermit-type diet of the time, and locusts, that is the insects, are allowed to be eaten as clean food in Leviticus. Josephus mentions John the Baptist in Antiquities of the Jews, but he doesn't have any of these lifestyle details. Mark's purpose here is to use this popular holy man as a springboard to elevate his own character. And he has John the Baptist saying, One more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to bend down and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. The whole point of this exercise is for Jesus to be able to leapfrog this holy man, John the Baptist, in holiness and to allow Mark an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to bear witness to Jesus' holiness. Verse 9. Now in those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan River. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my one dear Son, in you I take great delight. This is our introduction to Jesus, and he is placed in historical time and geographical space. Two locations. Even if the existence of Nazareth is contested, Galilee and the Jordan River are both mentioned. Also, he's connected with a well-known figure for whom we have independent attestation from Josephus. Three key historicising points within 20 words of introducing Jesus, none of which Paul gives in over 20,000 words. Unlike Paul, these historicising statements are clear and not open to varying interpretation, and a plain reading supports historicity. For mythicism to be true would require that Mark was either writing fiction, which he did not expect his readers to take as true, was sincere but mistaken, or was lying. Of the four possibilities, true, fiction, mistaken or lying, the simplest, i.e. true, supports historicity. All the others support mythicism, but they are not equally saleable. Some people do delight in regarding early Christians in general, and Mark in particular, as scurrilous liars, but for most, dismissing an important source as deceit would be a conclusion reached reluctantly and only with good evidence. Being sincere but mistaken is more or less the default position of secular interpretations of all religious history. The fictional position that Mark was writing fiction which he did not expect his audience to take seriously is a complex one with little precedent, but in truth what precedent there is is fairly close to the topic with Gnostic Christianity. Mark does tell us many things that we know aren't true, and there are some indications that he may have known what he's saying wasn't true. But nevertheless... The world of scholarship is reluctant to accuse him of deliberate deception, and therefore a mythicist position which has Mark sincere but mistaken is likely to be more saleable than has Mark as a liar. Another point to consider before moving on is who knows who Jesus is. In Mark's version of the baptism, we have as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Spirit descending on him. A voice came from heaven saying, You are my one dear son, in you I take great delight. 
In other words, this is direct person to person to Jesus. Nobody else seems to be aware. So at this introductory point, we can see that Mark knows who Jesus is, the Holy Spirit does, Jesus does, and the reader does. We'll soon find out that the evil spirits that Jesus casts out do. But aside from that, there's only one other person in the whole gospel who's really going to get it. And that's the aforementioned centurion from chapter 15. Anyway, going on. The spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, enduring temptations from Satan. He was with wild animals and angels were ministering to his needs. I'm not sure if there's much significance in the 40 days bit. 40 days is a standard Old Testament period. In Genesis it rained 40 days and 40 nights to cause the flood. Moses was with God 40 days and 40 nights connected with the Ten Commandments. And there are various other 40 day, 40 night periods in the Old Testament. And I doubt Mark had any particularly profound reason for picking that period. But why would he want Jesus booted out into the wilderness for any period? He tells us in the next verse. Now after John was imprisoned, Jesus went into Galilee and proclaimed the gospel of God. He said... The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe in the gospel. So apparently Mark wanted to use John the Baptist to endorse his character, but he did not want Jesus' ministry to overlap with that of John. Why not? Well, Mark has a problem here because he wants to use John to endorse his character, but John is a well-loved and well-remembered holy man, and Mark has to explain how John conceded Jesus' superiority, but did not hand over the reins of his movement when Jesus appeared. Mark's device is to have his Jesus baptised, and then immediately boot him out into the wilderness, until John's been arrested, and Jesus can start his own ministry from scratch, without the difficult complication of adding a possibly fictional element to a history that's well remembered. This scheme of Marx doesn't necessarily argue for mythicism, as it would be equally supportive of an argument that Jesus was a man who never met John the Baptist. I think the origin of this sojourn in the wilderness is fairly easy to see. The later gospel writers of course picked it up and ran with it, working it into a much more extensive temptation scenario. Anyway, in Mark 1, verse 16 and on, there follow a series of vignettes that are intended to establish Jesus' God-given authority in the eyes of a variety of witnesses. The disciples come first. As he went along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will turn you into fishers of people. They left their nets immediately and followed him. Going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in their boat, mending nets. Immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and followed him. Then they went to Capernaum. When the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them like one who had authority, not like the experts of the law. Notice that Mark doesn't tell us what Jesus taught. He just gives us the people's reaction to his teaching because the purpose of this is not to convey Jesus' message, but rather to establish his credentials. And the next witness is from the spirit realm. Just then, there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit and he cried out, Leave us alone, Jesus the Nazarene. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him. Silence, come out of him. After throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He even commands the unclean spirits and they obey him. So the news about him spread quickly throughout all the region around Galilee. This is the first of many cases where Jesus demands secrecy from others, in this case from the unclean spirit. This was termed a messianic secrecy by theologian William Reed in 1901. His explanation was that it was not historical, but it was added by Mark to explain why Jesus had been accepted as Messiah only after his death and resurrection, and not during his lifetime. That theory is no longer accepted, and historicists use different explanations for different occasions when Jesus instructs people to secrecy. There is another possibility, though, from the mythicist point of view. That is that Jesus swore people to secrecy in Mark's gospel to explain why it was that Mark's audience, 40 years after the events he was relating, had not heard of these events from either their oral or written traditions. 
On the other hand, Mark's got to establish Jesus' authority, popularity and respect appropriate to his Holy Spirit-filled career. And what he does here and repeatedly throughout the Gospel is to make sure that when there's wide acclamation of Jesus' achievements, then it is non-specific crowds who do the acclaiming. When it involves a character who was an early founder of the church and could form a line of transmission of historical details, they are always sworn to silence or just don't understand. Up next is healing the sick. Now as soon as they left the synagogue, they entered Simon and Andrew's house with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was lying down, sick with a fever, so they spoke to Jesus at once about her. He came and raised her up gently, taking her hand. Then the fever left her and she began to serve them. A rather unfortunate comment to modernise, implying that the primary reason to restore the health of a woman is so that she can serve you. When it was evening, after sunset, they brought to him all who were sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered by the door, so he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons. But he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Then Jesus got up early in the morning when it was still very dark, departed and went out to a deserted place, and there he spent time in prayer. Simon and his companions searched for him. When they found him, they said, Everyone is looking for you. He replied, Let us go elsewhere, into the surrounding villages, so that I can preach there too, for that is what I came out here to do. So he went into all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Now a leper came to him and fell at his knees, asking for help. If you are willing, you can make me clean, he said. Moved with indignation, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be clean. The leprosy left him at once and he was clean. Immediately Jesus sent the man away with a very strong warning. He told him, See that you do not say anything to anyone, but go show yourself to a priest and bring the offering that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. But as the man went out, he began to announce it publicly and spread the story widely, so that Jesus was no longer able to enter any town openly, but stayed outside in remote places. Still, they kept coming to him from everywhere. So why did Mark throw this one in? It looks as though Jesus is on a roll here. His miraculous healings are escalating in impressiveness, kicking off with a demon and curing a fever, healing a few sickies, but here we get a leper, somebody with a long-standing lethal disease that is not potentially self-limiting. The chronicity of the disease means there is every potential for the leprous status of this citizen to be widely known, and therefore his healing is correspondingly more impressive. And again, as we see throughout Mark, the adoring crowds are non-specific. The ex-leper disobeys Jesus and does not remain silent. That appears to defeat the purpose of silence, if it's really Mark's intention to shut down transmission. Furthermore, a reason for secrecy is implied here, as a lack of secrecy impedes Jesus' ministry, as he's not free to enter towns. However, the idea that favourable publicity impedes a ministry is a little bit hard to credit. So Mark chapter 1 has given some material for both sides of the argument. However, its main import is the unambiguously temporal and historical introduction to Jesus, which is obviously historicising and requires for mythicism to be true that it explains away this introduction.